Thanks for joining us today. And uh, today in our talk, we're going to learn how to build resilience in your AI applications with effective strategies for backup and disaster recovery for vector databases on Kubernetes. My name is Shweta, and I'm a member of technical staff at Veeam. I develop innovative solutions for data protection in various areas. Hey, all. Uh, my name is Pavan. I'm an engineering manager at Veeam. Uh, I lead a group of uh, cloud native engineers building uh, the data protection product for applications on Kubernetes. I also maintain a CNCF sandbox project called Canister. Uh, we are going to use that project today in our talk. Welcome again. So how many of you use uh, AI in your applications? See a lot of hands, I mean some hands, but uh, this is expected. Uh, this talk is going to be useful for all of you who raised your hands. Um, so there are a lot of reasons you might be using AI uh, in your applications, but here are some um, reasons why we thought AI is making a big impact. Uh, by predicting and scaling resources dynamically, uh, AI can enhance resource management. So this keeps performance, cost, uh, performance and cost optimized. Uh, then there is uh, security. So AI boosts security by detecting anomalies and blocking threats in real time. Uh, this makes more uh, like applications more resilient. Uh, then there's also user experience, I think, by uh, enabling personalization and natural interactions. For example, in customer support and uh, uh, even like interactions with for people on the application itself, uh, it creates more engaging experiences. Uh, finally, it's uh, not the least, but uh, it also helps with building self-healing abilities uh, by predicting you know, failures before they happen and reducing the downtime and interruptions. So overall, uh, AI is becoming a critical part of uh, all the applications today, making them more efficient, secure, and uh, engaging. Uh, the next simple question is, how many of you deploy these applications on Kubernetes? So again, uh, this is, I think it's very much expected. We have been seeing a lot of talks on uh, RAG and uh, deploying these on Kubernetes. Uh, there are a lot of reasons, again, uh, when you ask why, uh, it's mostly because of all these reasons we have listed here. Uh, high availability and scalability, uh, features like automatic failover, load balancing, dynamic scaling, uh, this helps meet performance and data integrity uh, requirements for these AI ML applications. Uh, then we, it improves uh, speed of model training by making it easy to deploy distributed uh, training workloads. And uh, dynamic scaling also helps with uh, CPU and GPU availability. Uh, again, making things more optimized resource management and cost and other things. Uh, Kubernetes is again like cloud agnostic, so AI applications can run on any cloud, any environment, even on-prem, without needing any changes uh, when we move things around uh, between environments. So it enables portability. It's very useful when we are looking at a multi-cloud or a, 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 you know, multi-vendor uh, um, requirements in our environments. So there's strong support for backup and disaster recovery. Some of it we'll cover in our talk. Uh, this makes it easier to deploy mission-critical applications. So with the growth of the community itself, we have seen uh, larger and larger KubeCons every year. And there's uh, the ecosystem itself is growing with a lot of projects. Uh, it's making it easy to uh, seamlessly integrate it with, integrate with uh, existing AI tools. Um, so it's becoming like a, an ideal platform for uh, AI workloads. So we can see this in uh, recent reports as well. Like yesterday, uh, Data on Kubernetes community released a report. Uh, there were 150 plus practitioners surveyed. And you can see some of the reasons that we just talked about. They've been mentioned as the top reasons why people are choosing Kubernetes to deploy their AI workloads. Uh, we can further expand this. We, if we see the type of workloads that are deployed on Kubernetes, uh, AI ML has seen a raise in the last two, three years. I think over 50% said that they deploy their AI apps on Kubernetes. So overall, I think there is momentum uh, that's making uh, orgs increasingly reliable 
uh, relying on uh, Kubernetes to deploy their AI workloads. Uh, so it makes Kubernetes a foundation for all these applications. Another important app observation that you can see from this image is that the vast majority of responders have said that they deploy databases on Kubernetes. How is this important for AI and ML workloads? We'll find out now. So those who said they use AI in your applications, do you use vector databases by any chance? Awesome. So AI applications that use vector databases as an information retrieval component are called retrieval augmented generation or RAG systems, and we're going to talk about that in detail. As AI takes the center stage for major companies, there's been a rise of unstructured data, images, text, audio, and video, which is something traditional databases struggle to handle effectively. This has ignited the need for crucial tools like vector databases, which excel at efficiently storing and retrieving these complex data, complex data types. So what is a vector? An n-dimensional vector is a set of n decimal numbers which capture the meaning of unstructured data. Each dimension or each number represents a specific feature or characteristic. And in this way, vector, the vector captures the meaning of the entire unstructured data. These vectors are generated by embedding models which are specially trained to process the specific data type. So applications of vector, vector databases are actually things all of us have seen. In search engines, you see image or text search. And in online shopping, you see product recommendations. Um, on OTT, you see recommendation of movies or, or series. Um, in banks, you see uh, detect, fraud detection to detect like anomaly detection. All of these are, have some vector, vector databases in underlying architecture. Another uh, important use case of vector databases, which we're going to focus on now, is uh, in large language model architecture, especially in generative applications like chatbots. Vector databases provide the additional context to the LLMs so that they don't hallucinate and give answers that are irrelevant to the user query. And they can also be used to provide source attribution and citations. So this generates trust and confidence in your system and such systems are called retrieval augmented generation or RAG systems. So we can visualize a vector database in a multi-dimensional space as shown in the image on the right. When the vector is inputted in the database, it automatically computes the similarity between the search query, the, basically the vector, and the existing collection of data points and puts it in clusters. So if you see here, the vector for bananas is located close to apples and not close to cats or dogs. So another intuitive way of understanding the power of vector databases and how this helps is on Google when you search apple taste, the word apple taste, and say apple valuation. You can make out the, dif the difference in results. Google is automatically able to understand that apple taste means the fruit and apple valuation means the company. And how does this do this? Because those vectors are far apart and the vector database is able to understand that. So this way of storing data is key to what makes vector databases different from other databases. The image on the left demonstrates the difference between vector databases and other common databases like key value, document, and graph, which are all good for respective use cases, really good use cases. But for this use case, like intelligent searching, vector databases help. They help to understand the nuance of the user queries and help to understand the intent behind the keywords, which is a drawback that traditional databases have because they mainly rely on keyword matching. So vector databases, since they capture the meaning of the entire data, they understand the semantic relationship that's encoded in them. Let's look at the basic architecture of a RAG system. So the main components are a knowledge base, which basically has the relevant text, audio, or video data for the specific application. We have the embedding model. So this ingests that unstructured data and converts it into vectors. Then we have the vector database itself, which stores those vectors long term and clusters them by similarity. We just saw that. We have the LLM, which is a pre-trained model that generates an output based on a given query. So if we go from left to right, when a user provides a query into the application, the embedding model converts it into a vector first, and then that is used to query the vector database. 
the vector database then generates a set of similar vectors, and these similar vectors act as the enhanced context for the LLM. So now the LLM is inputted with this enhanced context, the user query, and also a prompt which the LLM can understand. And with all this information, it gives an output that is relevant, and it's streamed back to the user. And we're going to use a similar architecture in our demo. In this architecture, we see that without the enhanced context from the vector database, the LLM could actually provide incorrect responses or could hallucinate, and this could affect the user experience and the business continuity. So with this and the importance of the data, the vector database, we move to the crux of our session, data protection. So uh, what is data protection? I think uh, some people in the audience have uh, written this white paper uh, in the data protection working group, which is a part of uh, six storage. So that paper defines data protection as the process of protecting uh, valuable application data and configuration running for all the applications in Kubernetes. Uh, the result of such a data protection uh, process is typically uh, called a backup. So in our uh, talk, we would just focus on the, the data part of the application. So why do vector databases need data protection? So uh, Shweta just explained, without a vector database, uh, the user queries may see some um, hallucinated answers from the LLM itself. So it's very crucial to have the vector database and also protect it. Uh, in case of data integrity and security, it becomes crucial that we protect these databases. Uh, they also hold high dimensional embeddings. We, we just talked about that. Uh, they're used for tasks like recommendations and similarity matching. So any, any data loss could lead to disruptions in the application itself. And uh, by having a disaster recovery uh, policy in place, it could uh, help in, in cases of like disasters. It could be natural disasters, uh, ransomware attacks, or even accidental uh, deletions. Uh, we can quickly restore data and uh, reduce the downtime uh, of, of the application itself. So uh, beyond uh, resilience, data protection offers uh, efficiency and cost savings. How, how does that, uh, it do that? Uh, backups prevent the need for uh, reprocessing and retraining models. So uh, these things can be very time consuming and cost, uh, costly, right? So backups help with that. And they also help with version control. In case some uh, issues arise, we can quickly roll back the updates on uh, indices and the data itself. Uh, in some cases, it could be required for uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, to meet those standards, backups are uh, a must in some, in some uh, regions and countries. So altogether, uh, backing up uh, vector databases, it's, uh, it helps ensure business continuity uh, efficiency and also data security. So uh, we just saw the RAG application. Uh, it could be complex uh, and there could be many components that are deployed on Kubernetes. So a vector database itself could use uh, PVCs as a, uh, as a method of storing or persisting data. There could also be the data source itself uh, deployed on the cluster. So depending on um, how it's deployed. Let's say for the PVCs, we could just do a storage level snapshot uh, on the, uh, the new image that popped up. You can see, uh, I mean, it's just an example of a cloud native app. It's pretty complex, not an AI application, but still uh, it has a Postgres in there. So connected to, let's say, a CSI uh, volume. So we could just take the CSI snapshot. Uh, those are crash consistent, so we could just be happy with that. Or uh, if we want the application to be aware of these uh, snapshots, uh, we could introduce hooks into the app itself. So use data service hooks to freeze and freeze uh, the database while these snapshots are taken so that there is uh, consistency there. Uh, or another option would be to directly use the tools provided by these databases. There's uh, PG dump, MySQL dump, or MongoDump, these provide like consistent views of the database itself. So we could directly invoke those tools and take backups. So uh, there's also a combination of these, right? If the app itself in, in the picture, we see that it's, there's MySQL and PGDump. So both of them would require snapshots and backups. So there's a combination required there. Uh, 
the question would arise, is there a data protection tool that can help us do this? Uh, we are actually happy to introduce Canister. Uh, it's, a, it's an open source project we have built. Uh, what is Canister? Canister is a data protection workflow management tool. Uh, provides a set of cohesive APIs uh, for defining and curating these data operations. They could be backups, restores, uh, and it abstracts away the tedious details of executing them. So it's easy to uh, trigger these backups uh, using Canister. Uh, it's an easy to install Helm chart, uh, available uh, like freely and uh, easy to operate and scale. Uh, last year, we uh, uh, got accepted into CNCF Sandbox, so it's a pro uh, part of CNCF now. Uh, the main components we see uh, would include uh, custom resources, blueprints, action sets, and profiles, uh, and, and a controller that manages lifecycle of these uh, custom resources. So the blueprints are the ones that help us define the workflows for uh, any of the operations we want to do. Uh, backups restore or even delete uh, if we want. And action sets are the ones that actually trigger these actions. So you create an action set and say, trigger a backup. Uh, it goes, uh, the controller knows and goes and uh, triggers it from the blueprint. Profiles actually define the target location for these backups. Uh, and they could also act as sources for restores. We also have a few adopters. Uh, we, being a part of uh, Veeam, uh, we are using Canister effectively, or uh, a lot in our product itself. Uh, and there are a few more uh, companies that also use Canister to, for their data protection needs. So how does Canister do this? Uh, just to give an example here, uh, let's assume a vector database workload exists on our cluster. We go deploy Canister controller. And the blueprint uh, we have authored to protect this vector database, let's say uh, PG vector. So we create an action set. This informs the controller to go look at the blueprint and uh, execute the action that we specified. So the controller then looks at the action which is defined uh, in the blueprint. Uh, typically, it's, it's like a, uh, a function or a script that goes in, uh, that we can execute in a, in a pod or a container. So it uses something called a canister function and uh, talks to the vector database workload. And we also provide like a, a small tool that goes and pushes this, uh, the dump that we have taken from the database into an object store. And this is pointed to by the profile. So overall, once the app, uh, operation is complete, the controller then informs the user uh, through the action set itself. So the action set contains the status of the operation. Thanks for that, Pavan. Let's, all put, let's now put it all together. We will now look at an end-to-end -end example using Canister to back up a vector data. So for this demo, we built a book recommendation chatbot called BookNest. So it's a question-answer application which talks to a vector database containing details of 175 books of various genres. Each book's description has been converted to a 384 dimension vector using the BAAI embedding model. We chose Postgres database with a PG vector extension, and this is because it's open source. It's easy to use if you're familiar with Postgres. All you have to do is simply add the PG vector extension. And it's also in increasing in popularity. I noticed it in many rag talks this KubeCon. So this is our demo architecture. This is what our cluster looks like. We have the app namespace, which is called PG Vector. It has the BookNest application deployment, ingress, and service. We also have the config map, which contains our book's knowledge base, and also the embedding model, which is used to translate between the book descriptions and their vector form. We also have the Postgres stateful set, the vector database that you see there. And in the canister namespace, we have the canister controller, which is Pavan just described that, and two CRs, the blueprint, uh, and the profile. So this profile it contains the credentials which we will use to connect to the backup location. So when a user enters a theme in the query, like a theme for a book that they are looking for, it will be translated to a vector by the embedding model and then passed to the vector database. 
The vector database accordingly provides a set of relevant vectors, basically a set of relevant book descriptions, which are aligned to the user query. And these vectors are translated back by the embedding model and displayed in front of us on the application. We we'll look at this now. So for the purpose of this demo, if you see, we don't have an LLM, because which is present in most RAG systems, we just saw it in RAG architecture. But this is because what we want to talk about is how to protect the vector data, the, which is the most important part. So using these canister components, we will now show you how to back up the vector database of books. I hope it's uh, visible. OK, so if you see there, um, I'm taking a sample prompt and putting it in the window. And we see uh, a bunch of suggestions provided by the vector database. Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, these are all relevant to the theme that the user has provided. All right, let's look at an alternate prompt. Honestly, this is one of my favorite themes. And uh, these are all some relevant books according to that theme. So it's, these results are important because we're going to see at the end of the demo that the results are the same even after a disaster. Now let's look at the pods in the app namespace, which is called PG Vector. We have the chat deployment pod, the chat pod that we saw the Jupyter Notebook, which we use to input the data into Postgres, and the Postgres pod itself. Let's enter the Postgres pod, and there we are. We log into Postgres using PSQL, using the user Postgres, that's a username, and connecting to the database called app. Let's list out the databases, and we see one of them is app. So that's the database that has the documents table, which has all the vectors, all our book vectors, basically. Now let's run a sample query on the documents table with the author, Suzanne Collins. So we see there's ID, author, uh, descript yeah, title, description, and embedding. These are all columns of the uh, documents table. Sorry about this. And yeah, this is the output of that query. Suzanne Collins is the author of Hunger Games. So that's the book name stored in the vector database. And the description, this is the vectorized version of that description. There are 384 dimensions, which means 384 such numbers corresponding to that description. So now let's see, um, OK. You see the pods in the canister namespace? I think it's being covered. Yeah, awesome. So we see the canister operator pod. That's what runs the canister controller that we just talked about. And the next thing to do is see what secrets are there in the app namespace. So the first thing is PG secret. And we use this uh, in the blueprint that we'll see now to connect to the Postgres um, database. It has the Postgres username and password. And um, this is the S3 profile, and we'll use the S3 secret um, there, and I'll talk about it right now when we look into it. So the S3 secret basically contains the AWS, in this case AWS, because we're using S3, those credentials to connect to the S3 bucket. So it reads that from the secret there. This is the location, just a test bucket we have here, and the region. So everything is specified in that profile, which Canister will use during backup and restore. Now let's see if we have any existing blueprints in the Canister namespace. It seems like we don't. And before we create a blueprint, let's see um, what a blueprint looks like. So uh, just to go over the blueprint, uh, sorry, I don't see it well today, uh, this side, but uh, the blueprint itself has, uh, let me know if it's not visible. Okay. So the blueprint itself has, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a Kubernetes CR, so all the metadata stuff is cool. the same. And then we have uh, actions defined here, the first one being backup. Oh, and, backup. Oh, oh, I see. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. 
So the first action that we have defined is a backup. Uh, and each action in canister has a set of phases. In our case, we just have a single phase. Uh, I think it's called PG dump here. And uh, like I said, the, the function that we use is called cube task here. We have a few functions. It's pretty extensible. So anyone uh, wanting to write their own custom functions, it's possible in canister. So we start with cube task, which uh, just creates a pod in the namespace that we want, connects to the database, and uh, does the operation. So we see that the um, operation itself creates an output. Uh, it's called an output artifact. And in this case, it's a backup location. Uh, so whatever location inside that S3 bucket contains the backup, it, that is what we store. So uh, let's move to the function itself. So the function takes in an image for the container that it needs to spin up. In this case, it's a custom uh, container image that we have built. The reason for this being, uh, it, it, the base is a Postgres image, but we have added the PG vector extension in there along with the tool uh, called CanDo, which Canister provides. And this interacts with the S3 uh, like we described. So if we look at the actual execution, we are using PG dump, PG dump all, uh, to take a consistent view of the uh, Postgres. And then we archive it and push it uh, to the S3 using CanDo. Once it's done, uh, we just store the backup location uh, in the artifact. Now, uh, looking at the restore, the first thing it does is takes in the uh, artifact or the output that the backup gave as the input here. And then rest of it is pretty similar, uh, takes in all the same arguments, but just the command or the script itself is different. In this case, it's first using can do to pull in the data from the S3 location, and then it starts uh, starts the database with that new database file that we just downloaded. Uh, there's also a delete operation which uh, we could use to go and delete the backups from the backup location. So let's come back to the demo. I think we are going through the blueprint in there. Yeah, perfect. Um, oh, just a little bit back. Anyway, it's fine. It's we saw that uh, we created the blueprint here, and um, now what we're doing is starting to run the backup. So first thing we need, uh, can you just pause for a second? Yeah, OK, awesome. So I just wanted to explain this command. So the first thing we need while creating a backup, this is important, is that uh, we need to pick up the name of the S3 profile. So if you see while creating the backup action set, uh, can we move that play above? So that you can see the, awesome, awesome, thank you. So if we see the command here, uh, we're using something called canctl. Canctl is a CLI specially built for canister, which is used to create action sets like this. Here we're using um, an action set called backup. Uh, and if you remember, action set was what Pavan just described uh, while explaining canister. And it, it's created in the namespace canister and using the blueprint that we just created, Postgres PP. And uh, it backs up the stateful set, which is the Postgres vector database. And we pass in this profile, which is the S3 profile. And we see that the uh, action set has been created. At this point, the canister controller sees that an action set has been created. And then it starts the backup. We see that the backup is complete. The canister controller completed the backup. And it updated the action set again. That was just in seconds. And now if we describe that action set, we see that it's basically a custom CR. It's using the same blueprint that we created. It's backing up the stateful set. So everything that we passed in, it's kind of successfully understood it and backed it up. And it's using, yes, that S3 profile to connect to the credentials in the S3 profile to connect to that backup location and back up all the vector data to that location. So if you see here, it's kind of storing the backup location as a cloud artifact. And um, it uh, executes the uh, PG dump operation there. That PG dump operation is what we saw in the blueprint under as a phase under backup. So 
let's now um, kind of mock a disaster now that we have done a backup. So here I've asked Pawan to kind of copy a database. So uh, you want to talk yeah, about? at the end of a meeting, she asked me to copy the database, create a new uh, copy and start using it. But after a long day of a lot of meetings, instead of copying, I just ended up deleting. So she and comes now, in uh, the next morning, this is what happens. Yeah, I go to check my list of books again, and the app database is missing. And I'm shocked, obviously. And then I go and try the other prompt that worked before, and turns out it doesn't work again. But thankfully, we had taken a backup of all the vector data using Canister. And now using Canister again, we're going to bring all that data back and our application back just in seconds. And the first thing to do, uh, and it's kind of not visible here, but we actually have to, yeah, all right. We have to pick up the name of the backup action set. And so everything that we passed while creating the backup action set, the stateful set, the blueprint, all of that, it's going to directly pick up from the action set. We don't have to pass it again during restore. And so using CanCTL, we created the restore action set. And um, that triggers canister controller in the back end, which starts performing the restore. And let's see if it's complete. The canister controller completed the restore and updated the action set back to complete. So we're going to look at the action set in detail. And we'll see that it's understood what the backup location is and uh, pulled in all that vector data. And it's also understood where to restore the stateful set Postgres. We never passed it in. It, it picked it up directly from the action set that we passed in. And now let's see if things work now that the data has been restored. With fingers crossed, I go put this again, and it looks like it's been restored. Everything is back. Our customers are happy, customers of BookNest. Let's go and verify if the other thing is also working. And if you notice, the results are pretty consistent because these are all the similar vectors that the vector database has given up for that theme. So yeah, uh, we saw a great demo. Thanks, Vita. And I think uh, we averted a disaster. Uh, she fixed my accidental deletion there uh, within seconds. So uh, we talked about a lot of things today, uh, but what are the key takeaways from, from our talk here? Uh, we went through AI becoming a core part of applications, uh, how uh, Kubernetes is the go-to platform for these, and then we saw how Canister helps with protecting this, uh, because vector databases are important for RAG applications, and it's important to protect them. Uh, so the key takeaways for uh, all of you would be that you need data protection, so uh, always plan ahead. So consider data protection as a day zero operation, uh, not just before deploying applications, but also when you're building applications. So a lot of data protection products and uh, others, other tools like Canister can easily integrate with your apps uh, to uh, back, back it up. And uh, to learn more, uh, please do visit us at our booth, at uh, you know, K7 booth at Veeam. And also the Canister has a project pavilion booth. Uh, it's going on today, and also I think there's a morning session tomorrow, so uh, we would love to meet you there. Uh, also, again, we encourage all of you to check out the Canister project, uh, contribute. Uh, we would love to co-author blueprints for other vector databases. Uh, we are also in the process of building the community, so in case you have any feedback, uh, any inputs, we would be happy to hear. Here are some useful links that we referenced all through the presentation. And uh, I think the presentation is shared on SCED. You can go ahead, check out all these links. Hope this session was useful to all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. And please do scan this QR code to give us feedback on the talk. Thank you again. Uh, yeah. We would love to hear how you're using AI uh, in your applications and uh, where and how you're deploying it. 
and uh, finally the data protection needs as well. So find us on, in the hallway, come talk to us. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank Thanks. you.